study. Here we're going to be going into a uh, topical study for uh, this this uh, week um, for Sunday here today. And we're going to go into uh, continuing with what we've been doing, where we've been taking uh, our famous uh, American food chains and we've been putting it into the title lightheartedly of our studies. We've done so far, we went into Haggai chapter two a couple studies ago, and we had called it uh, Israel's uh, shake and stake, where God shakes uh, the earth and the heavens at that time. And then the Gentiles, you know, put their stake into, uh, you know, like their their uh, investments of gold and, and silver and everything into Israel during uh, the their earthly kingdom. Uh, when that comes to pass, the millennial kingdom, that was Haggai chapter two. We went through that a couple studies ago. We just called it, you know, Israel's stake and shake going after restaurant title studies. Then we went to Daniel chapter 11, and we had talked about how uh, the different kingdoms you read about in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, all being the same topic, also work its way into Daniel chapter 11. And you go all the way through the uh, kingdom of uh, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. And when you get to Rome in Daniel chapter 11, verse 17, you get into Julius Caesar. You know, and then different chapters talk about different people being the little horns of uh, this and that, Greece and Rome and everything else. And so we called this one uh, uh, Daniel's Little Caesar in, um, in uh, that Daniel study we did, Daniel chapter 11. We went into uh, the next one, we went into, I believe it was our last study we did on Wednesday. We went into Amos chapter 4, the book of Amos chapter 4. Talked about how the, uh, the olive trees and, and the gardens that were there during uh, the fifth course of judgment were going to be destroyed because of Israel's uh, idolatry and obstinance and everything else. And so we pre pretty much went to a study of Amos's Olive Garden, and we had talked about just different types of, you know, just associating those restaurant food chain names as a little lighthearted way to go through the different verses and studies. And so now we're going into, uh, if anyone's got those firehouse subs in those in your different areas, we're going into Obadiah chapter one and the only one chapter in the first place, but Obadiah chapter one, if you look at verse 18, and here's where we're getting all this from this week, it says, uh, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there uh, shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. Now we'll get into the verse, we'll get, we'll get to uh, how we get to that verse. But you're seeing pretty much, you know, mentioning there of, you know, fire and a house. And so we're getting into uh, Obadiah's firehouse, you know, so we're associating firehouse subs with Obadiah here. And we're kind of getting into the book of Obadiah this week uh, or this study today. And so we'll kind of run. This will be kind of the one hour rundown or hour and a half rundown, whatever we're doing here um, in the book of Obadiah. So we'll go through that so we can kind of plug in what we're reading here, kind of get some good uh, information out of it. Plug it into where we've been so far with Haggai chapter 2, Daniel chapter 11, Amos chapter 4. Here we are in Obadiah chapter 1. So we're just going through the different minor and major prophets so we can see good information. And then lots of times we don't get the opportunity. Uh, lots of people don't read the entire Bible, maybe even once in their life. Um, some do, some don't. So we're taking time just to get the good information, maybe connect it where we can. See where it comes into play, the day of the Lord, with the millennial kingdom, with Daniel's 70th week, with uh, times on God's timeline and the ages to come when we rightly divide the word of truth. Even how that works with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, everything even in the Psalms, and a little bit of the Proverbs as well. So we're kind of plugging all that in together, seeing what we can do, where we can, plug it all in so we can see what God is trying to say in his prophetic uh, program there. Now, of course, we know the body of Christ. We're not in the prophetic program. We're not We're not a part of that. We can still learn all about it, though. We can still learn everything that we're going to hear, uh, you know, read about, study about, learn about. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth. In fact, it's commanded to us to do so. So we're going to go ahead and do that and still learn what God's, you know, how God deals with other people in other times. Um, learn his purposes, learn his plans, understand how he's going to uh, work with different people in different times, Hebrews chapter one, verse one, and kind of go from there. So we're going to see and take a look at this. So we'll go into uh, Obadiah, and here we are, you know, just one chapter. And he's pretty much uh, Obadiah, just like Nahum, just like uh, Jonah. They're not going to any northern kingdom. They're not going to any southern kingdom, which is going to be taken away into either an Assyrian uh, captivity or a Babylonian captivity. 
they're going out to Gentile kingdoms. If you remember, Jonah went out to Nineveh. Nahum goes 100 years later to Nineveh. Um, and what we're seeing here is that Obadiah is going out to Esau's descendants. If you remember from uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, Jacob uh, Esau's descendants uh, were the nation of Edom. And so he's going to go out there and he's going to preach to them, just as Jonah was supposed to preach, and he does eventually. He preaches to Nineveh. So we've got some uh, prophets that you read about, the ma major and the minor prophets, that are supposed to preach to the northern kingdom. Some are supposed to preach to the southern kingdom and warn them. You have other prophets that are supposed to preach to the Gentile kingdoms. And so this is one of them here, uh, Obadiah. He's supposed to be preaching to the Gentile kingdom. So we'll take a look at that here. And so we'll start in verse 1. We'll try to work our way, and most likely we will. We'll get to verse 18 and a little bit of beyond. And uh, again, this is the quick one hour and a half version, if not less. So we're not going to cover every single solitary thing. This book, if we went verse by verse and word for word, it'd take a couple weeks. And uh, it's probably the better way to go, of course, but this is our quick rundown. This is our Obadiah Firehouse 90-minute, 80-minute study, whatever it is, um, the short version. So it's also the enjoyable version. We're going to go through and take a look. So uh, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1, mm -hmm. uh, saying that the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Uh, so we're seeing it start out already. It's saying the vision of Obadiah. Uh, already just telling us, you know, that this is from God to Obadiah. And he's saying, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. So his audience is going to the descendants of Esau, which is the nation Edom. So we're already seeing to whom the audience is, God to Obadiah, Obadiah to Edom. So again, you try to put, plug yourself into this book, uh, it's not going to come out very well for us as members of the church, the body of Christ, with the Apostle Paul's our pattern, whereas we're going out to preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, we're not going to find anything here in the book of Obadiah. Yet, tons to learn from, tons to grow on, tons, you know, it's there for our learning, as Romans talks about. Uh, plenty to learn from. So we see here the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. He's saying this, you know, the heathen nations. An ambassador is sent among the heathen nations, essentially, they're, they're those that are there. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. And so they're pretty much talking about here, they're sent among the, the heathen to rise up against Edom. And they're saying, you know, there's essentially, you're seeing a, a revolution being started up against the nation of Edom uh, as this ambassador. Basically, you're seeing an ambassador is sent among the other the other heathen nations, saying, Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. So already Edom is being told, uh, you know, that uh, by Obadiah or others here, we've heard a rumor from the Lord uh, that other nations are looking to you know, revolt against you, Edom. Other nations are looking to rise up against you in battle. And this is already starting up rough for Edom. And for chapter 1, verse 1, and Edom's already being told, you know, it looks like there's already those that are looking to overtake you. And it's the, you know, the, it's among the heathen that are looking to do it. So he says this here. And he says, uh, behold, verse 2, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. And so we see this here. And so God's reduced them pretty much nationally. You remember, they've got a Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 3 covenant going on. Abrahamic covenant is going on. Blessing those that bless Israel and cursing those that curse Israel. And so we see this uh, come into play here. It says, Edom, you know, never really conquered much in the scriptures. And if you look at Amos chapter 1, verse 11, just one book over. Even Amos talks about this. Amos chapter 1, verse 11. said uh, Amos was saying this. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four will I not turn away the punishment thereof, because... He did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. And he's saying, but I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. And it goes more into this uh, a little bit later. But you're seeing him talk about this, even in the book of Amos, that uh, he's going to come in and indeed you know, punish the uh, transgressions of Edom, that nation. So he goes forth and he says this here. 
And so this is the part that we're just seeing here. If we look also at Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 1, talking more about you know, Edom and everything else, Ezekiel chapter 35 and verse 1, there's going to be more mentioned about you know, Edom in here. But he's saying, Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. And as he's going through this, he's pretty much you know, letting them know that you know, as Esau despised his birthright in the book of Genesis, you know, as he blessed, as he failed to bless those that bless Israel, he's cursing those that curse Israel. Uh, he's, he's pretty much saying that as he despises, as he's greatly despised, it's because he has once despised his birthright. And so it's essentially uh, as the uh, Genesis 12 covenant works its way out, uh, he's essentially receiving payback for you know, trading in his birthright for lentil soup, uh, as you read about in the book of Genesis. He despised his birthright. He despised, and his birthright was him being heir to the Abrahamic covenant. So he's essentially saying, I, I don't care about being the heir to God's purpose and plan, which is the prophetic program. I, I could care less about God's earthly dominion. I could care less about being heir to this. I don't want anything to do with it. I'd rather have some lentil soup than be a part of what God's purpose and plan is for the earth. And so as he despises that, as Esau despises that, he's saying in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 2, you know, thou art, now because of the Genesis 12 covenant, thou art greatly despised as a nation. His descendants play out. And so he, they're despised as a nation. But going into Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 1, and what we're going to see here, he says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Sair, and prophesy against it. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out my hand against thee, and will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity. We just saw that a little bit in Amos. In the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Uh, Sith thou uh, hast not uh, hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Sair most desolate, and cut off from it uh, him that passeth out, and him that returneth. And I will fill his mountains with his slain men, in thy hills, and in thy valleys, and in all thy rivers they shall fall that are slain with the sword. And I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine. And it kind of goes on from there. But you're seeing what's happening in uh, um, Ezekiel 35, 1 through 9. He's saying, I shall make Mount Sair most desolate and cut off from him it that passeth out and him that returneth. And he's constantly talking about Mount Sair, Mount Sair. And if we look at Genesis chapter 36, verse 8, this is where we're going to see where this all comes into play. Uh, Genesis 36, verse 8. The whole point where we're talking about uh, you know, Mount Sayer. Mount Sayer is going to be most desolate. Mount Sayer is going to be paying the price. Mount Sayer, him that comes in and out of Mount Sayer, you're going to receive a lot of punishment. Uh, you're going to be most desolate. You, know, you guys over there in Mount Sayer. And here's where all this comes into play. Genesis 36, uh, verse 8. And it says, uh, thus dwell Esau in Mount Sair. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Sair. And these are the names of Esau's sons, so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. So Esau goes and lives in Mount Sair. Uh, Esau becomes the nation Edom. Here's his descendants. There's the names in Genesis 36. Uh, we won't go through the list. But if you need them, if you need details, there it is in Genesis 36. Uh, the point where we get back to Obadiah chapter, uh, well, chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. So they're living up in the rocks of Mount uh, Sair. They're greatly despised. They're a small nation. They've never conquered much. And even now, based on chapter, uh, or verse 1, chapter 1, he's saying, you know, they're hearing that there's nations that are going to rise up against them in battle. So they're not doing too well as a nation. They're hearing all sorts of things, and they're, you know, they're greatly despised in prophecy. And so they're not, you know, they're not doing too great as, as a nation based on the Genesis 12 uh, covenant, and they're greatly despised. 
if you look at Romans chapter 9, verse 13, this is why even Paul says what he says. That's Romans chapter 9. That's when you start studying Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. And this is some of what Paul has to say. It's going to be uh, Romans 9, verse 13. You go back to books like Obadiah, and you go back to books like Amos chapter 1 and Ezekiel 35, and you start seeing this is how Paul meant what he meant. And he says in Romans 9, verse 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. So he's saying in verse 13, Jacob, the nation, Israel, have I loved, but Esau, you know, the nation, uh, have I hated. So he's referring not just to the individuals, but he's referring to their descendants and uh, everything else. And Obadiah is proof of that. The book, Obadiah is proof of that. So we see the saying, you can read about it more in Genesis as well, but you see the pl it play out in prophecy in Obadiah and, and further on. So we're seeing this is why he's, he's pausing and saying this here. But he says, I would greatly despise. Verse 3, going back to Obadiah, verse 3 says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou, thou that dwellest in the cleft of the rock, there's Mount Sair, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? So the whole time they're there, they're filled with pride, and this is what they're saying. They think they're they're uh, they're amazing people. There, they're saying that uh, you know, even though there's, they know there's a revolution against them. They know that they're greatly despised. They know that they are who they are, and yet they say in their heart, you know, who's going to bring me down? No one's going to bring me down. I'm you know, I'm I'm the greatest nation there ever was. Is essentially what they're thinking. Is who shall bring me down to the ground? So you're seeing the the pride in their heart as to you know what they're thinking. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, is what he's saying here. It almost sounds a little bit like uh, what you hear in uh, Isaiah 14 with, with the, the heart of Satan, his plans and his purposes, where he talks about him ascending into uh, the, uh, the clouds of heaven, where he talks about that uh, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, you know, that he wants to be like the most high, and so on and so forth. Uh, it sounds a lot like Isaiah 14. So we see this here in verse... Uh, Three, the Satan is who shall bring me down to the ground. Verse four, going into Obadiah, he says, uh, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, again, sounds more like Isaiah 14, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. The Lord's going to bring them down. The Lord's going to make them desolate. The Lord's going to do all this in prophecy, is what we're seeing here. If we look at Jeremiah 49, verse 16. Jeremiah 49, verse 16. What you're seeing here <clears throat> is that it's being, being said again here. And we'll see even more about this in just a minute. He says in uh, Jeremiah 49, 16, Thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart, O that dwellest in the cleft of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill, so thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from hence, saith the Lord. Interesting that you see almost verbatim the same thing there, but we're going to see this uh, come up again. We're going to see actually a lot more than this just come up. It almost was the, uh, the same verse verbatim, and we're going to see a lot more than that in just a minute. But we see this in verse uh, verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. This Jeremiah was saying the same thing. So he continues with his thought there in verse 5. He says, If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? So he's going forth and he's letting him know, Esau, you're not the hot stuff you think you are. You're not the greatest nation that your heart is perceiving you to be. He's seeing this in verse 5. He's saying, you know, if thieves came to thee, robber, if robbers by night, uh, he says, would they not have a stolen until they have enough? And you see, you know, robbers could come and take it all from you, is what he's saying. If you look at Isaiah 17, verse 6, Good cross-reference verse here is Isaiah uh, 17 and verse 6.
he talks about this with the robbers and he talks about this with the with the uh, grape gatherers. He says, yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bough, four or five in the outmost uh, fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. And so he's talking, and you see you know, the shaking of all this uh, based on what you're seeing in verse five. If grape gatherers came to thee, uh, would they not leave some grapes? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty much saying, you know, the robbers can come and take everything from you to the point where you may not have enough stuff to steal. Uh, you know, you may not be good enough for the robbers, uh, is what we're seeing here in verse five. And so he's saying this here. And if you look while you're in Isaiah, Isaiah 24, verse 12. Let's say at 24, verse 12, <clears throat> you see it again a little bit. He says, And the city is left desolation, and uh, the gate is smitten with destruction. And thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people. There uh, shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the uh, gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. See more about the concept of, of uh, not only shaking, uh, read about that in Amos, but uh, you're also seeing in verse five about, you know, the taking of things and the, and the desolation and the robbing and the, and the uh, you know, the grape gathering concepts there. So he talks about this here in verse five. He's saying, if thieves came to thee, if robbers by name, uh, how art thou cut off? Would they uh, not have stolen till they had enough? I mean, they, they can take all they want. You're not the country you think you are. It says, if the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? And so essentially saying they could do this. And then he says in verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are the hidden things sought up? And he's pretty much saying that, uh, you know, the things that you are trying to keep secret, God can make known to all nations. Uh, you know, in any way, shape, or form, you know, a good cross-reference, we won't turn to it now, is Daniel chapter 2, verse 22. God can make hidden things known. God can make secret things, even the things that East, Edom is trying to keep hidden from all the nations around them, whether it's their riches, their plans, their military, whatever it is. God can make known to these nations through even this ambassador that's being sent among the heathen in verse 1, you know, how to rise up against them, how to destroy them in battle. God could use the other heathen to destroy the other heathen, if that's what God's plans and purposes are. Uh, but it's saying God's going to do it himself, and we'll get a little more into that in just a minute. But we're seeing that in verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? They're actually searched out. They're not this nation that thinks, you know, they think they're so great, but there's things that can be easily, they can be plundered easily, they can be robbed easily, they can be searched out easily, uh, their hidden things can be sought up easily. Uh, they're not, you know, the great thing that they think they are. And so we see this here, and then he find, they explain why in uh, verse uh, verse 7, but an interesting point that we see here in verse 6, we'll, we'll kind of look at this in a minute, um, or park here for just a minute, is what we were just seeing a moment ago. If we go back to Jeremiah chapter 49, we've read about six verses so far in the book of Obadiah. And it's Jeremiah 49, verse 14. That's Jeremiah 49, verse 14. We saw a moment ago where we saw a verse look pretty much identical to uh, verse 4. Now, the thing was Jeremiah 49, verse 16, I think it was. We go to Jeremiah 49, verse 14. What you're going to see here is almost a, a repeat, and it pretty much is a repeat. Jeremiah takes the book of Obadiah and plugs it into his book. And what you see here, if you look at Jeremiah chapter uh, 49, verse 14, here's our book of Obadiah again. I have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, Gather ye together, and come against her, and rise up to the battle. For, lo, I will make thee small among the heathen, and despised among men. Thy terribleness hath deceived thee in the pride of thine heart, O that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill. Though thou shouldest make thee nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Also Edom shall be a desolation. Every one that goeth by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss at the plagues thereof. And as you keep reading, as you keep going through, you'll see the book of Obadiah is in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is using the book of Obadiah to you know, prove a point concerning Edom. So he just flat out takes the book of Obadiah, plugs it into what he's doing. So we kind of see who came first. Obadiah came before Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is profiting from the lessons that are in Obadiah concerning prophecy. So we see that there in, in uh, Jeremiah 49, but going back into verse 
6, he's saying how the things of Esau are searched out and how his hidden things are sought up. It's to the point where Jeremiah can just repeat what's in Obadiah, and now everything concerning Edom is in two books instead of one. So we see that there in verse 7, uh, Obadiah 1, 7, <clears throat> says, All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. So now they're going forth and they're talking. Uh, he's still, Obadiah is still uh, you know, writing or, or preaching to uh, the nation Edom, Esau's descendants. And he's saying, all the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. Uh, the men that were at peace with thee had deceived thee. So he's saying, you've got, you've got a league going on, you've got a group going on, you've got a confederacy going on uh, of, of certain nations, and they're the ones tricking you. You're not in this group. Uh, you, know, you all do have a purpose and plan, this, this group of nations. And we'll see what that is in just a minute. But they're the ones deceiving you. They're the ones who are going to be a traitor to you in the end. If we look at uh, Psalm 83, this is where we're going to see this confederacy. Psalm 83, verse 1. And this is a good prophetic verse you want to keep and remember. If you need to use this for any reason when you're studying prophecy, this is a confederacy or a league of nations, a group of nations that are against God's purpose and plans in prophecy. So we see here, Psalm 83, verse 1, Keep, that, or keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies... I make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. Now, the hidden ones are the ones that are going to run and hide in, uh, from Matthew 24. They're going to go run and hide into the wilderness. And there's probably other times in Scripture where their faithful remnants had to run and hide for whatever reasons. But they're going to be, they're consulting against the hidden ones. Uh, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may no more may be no more in remembrance. That's the point of this league. That's the point of this group of nations and prophecy. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. There's the confederacy that they're seeing in uh, Obadiah. Edom's a part of it. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hegreens, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, uh, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher is also joined with them. Uh, they have hoped with the children of Lot, Selah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin uh, at the brook of Kisan, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. And it kind of just goes on talking about, you know, destroy all these guys, Lord, because they're making a confederacy to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And, of course, we know at this day and time and the dispensation of grace, that's not an issue. Uh, but in prophecy, of course, that's Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And, and it's pretty much saying in verse 4, their purpose is come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Uh, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Verse 6 gives the list of nations that are in a confederacy to go and destroy uh, Israel. And you see that there in verse six. Now you try to do that today, and you're gonna you know, try to say, "Well, this is this must be this nation. This would be." Then God's not about nations today. Nation building, nation destroying. He's not doing any of that today. Not our nation, not their nation, not any nation. So it's not that in this dispensation today, but it is absolutely about that in prophecy, in the dispensation of law, in in the ages to come, and in time past. So we see this here in uh, Psalm eighty-three. You're seeing in verse six. You're seeing in verse seven. At verse 8, and so on. Coming back to Obadiah, now you're seeing what well, you're seeing in verse 7, where he says, All the men of thy confederacy, been talking to Edom, have brought thee even uh, to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. So they're looking to trick Edom. All these, uh, these nations, all the men of this, this group, are actually looking to trick Edom in the end. Once they do what they do, or, or even before that, they're looking to trick Edom, and Obadiah is you know, just preaching to them, giving them stern warning, saying, you know, you're, you've been always on the wrong side of the fence, and you're 
it's you know you're getting worse with this confederacy and so he's letting them know this you know all the groups of your confederacy it's that's not helping you out any further and so he goes forth and he, and he says this here and he says that uh i've deceived thee um uh, i prevailed against thee a good cross reference we won't turn to it is jeremiah 38 22 so if you want to use that as a good cross reference we can you know um, I would present that to you. You can refer to that concerning deception and prevailing against them. It says, they that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. So that kind of sounds like uh, you know, a traitorous act. And for that, if we look at Psalm 41, verse 9, this should sound a little familiar. There's Psalm 41, verse 9. Just to get the concept of... Uh, traitorous act here in this case we're learning it from the nation edom who's in this confederacy and the other nations are looking to uh you know turn on them but when it talks about how there's going to be they that eat bread have laid a wound under thee or eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee yeah eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee psalm 41 verse 9 says yea mine own familiar friend and whom i trusted which did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me of course talking about the lord jesus christ talking about uh um just lost his uh our judas um and so you're seeing a different you know same spiritual principle same spiritual concept of what you're seeing there when it comes to the lord jesus christ and him being betrayed so on and so forth you're seeing with the nation Edom and how his confederacy is looking to betray him as well. Now, two totally different types of things. You know, Edom is not this great, amazing savior of anything, uh, but you're seeing the concept of betrayal uh, being portrayed in Psalm 41, um, also with the book of Obadiah. If you look further in, John 13 is going to explain the difference. John 13, verse 18, as we go there. John chapter 13, verse 18. I want to go there for an intentional reason and intentional purpose. The Lord says to the whole flock of Israel, he says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. So the Lord's saying, you know, unlike you know this um, comparison we're doing right now with the nation of uh, Edom, having this confederacy, you know, turn against them, uh, you know, when we're saying that uh, uh, they that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee, and so we're seeing that it, it's going to be more of a shock to the nation of Edom. The Lord's saying in John chapter 13, he's saying here in verse 18, he's saying that scripture may be fulfilled. I'm going to go ahead and let this guy do this, dude. Uh, and this, in this case, he's saying that scripture may be fulfilled. In the end, it's that the Lord, you know, uh, fulfills not only scripture, but the revelation of mystery will take place as a result. But he's saying that scripture be, uh, is fulfilled. The Lord knows exactly what's going on. He's fully omnipotent and uh, omnipresent of everything that's taking place. Uh, so there's, of course, a major difference between the betrayal here. But nonetheless, the concept of betrayal is what we're seeing in verse 7 going back to Obadiah uh, chapter 1, verse 7. All the men of thy confederacy uh, have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in them. And so he's making this point, you know, in regards to this. If we look at Isaiah chapter 19, verse 11. Isaiah 19, verse 11. He's saying there's no understanding it when it comes to uh, you know the concepts of of even the wisest people in Edom. He's saying there's just no understanding in these guys. Isaiah chapter 19 verse 11 he says, "Surely the princes, surely the princes of uh, Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh has become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they?" Where are thy wise men? And let them uh, tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed unto Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Znuf are deceived. Uh, they have also seduced Egypt, even they that are uh, the stay of the tribes thereof. 
And so you see this mentioned here about you know the wise men. This is more so talking about Egypt, but you're seeing how the wise men are actually fools in these Gentile nations. And so he's saying that there are none understanding in them, referring to also what's the, the supposed wise men in the nation Edom, that they're just a bunch of fools. And he goes forth and he says this here in verse 8. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 8 goes forth and says, Shall I not say, or shall I not in that day, in the day of the Lord, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the uh, Mount of Esau? There's that Mount Sire again, uh, you know, out of uh, Mount, uh, Mount of uh, Esau, verse 9, and thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the uh, Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter goes forth and mentions this. And so we're going to take a look more about the slaughter in greater detail later. Uh, but we'll see this uh, come through in just, a, in just a couple of verses. We're kind of going to see this in verse 18, where it's going to break down more of the slaughter. But uh, he's saying um, that every one amount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. So we'll zoom in on the slaughter later. And in verse 10, it says, For thy violence uh, against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. And thou shalt be cut off forever. If we look at the book of Numbers, we'll see where this came into play. Numbers chapter 20, verse 14. Let's see the book of Numbers uh, 20, verse 14. We see here it says that uh, we have this right. It says that Moses sent the messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Uh, Thus saith the, uh, thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and, and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand or to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him, and with much people, and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, uh, there, wherefore Israel turned away from him. And the children of uh, Israel, even through... Uh, even the whole congregation journeyed through from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. So you're seeing where the nation Edom, even though Israel is their descendants and uh, Edom is Esau's descendants, they're supposed to be somewhat brotherly, at least to, to some capacity. And they're still saying, no, you cannot come through my nation. You can't walk through it. If uh, you, We're not letting you through in any way, in any shape, in any form. And, uh, you know, to, Genesis 12 covenant is in play. You you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed as a result. And so they constantly do not allow any um, opportunity or advantage to Israel. And so this is what we're seeing here. And so uh, he goes forth and he says this, and he goes, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, we just saw in Numbers chapter 20, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. And he goes forth and he says this here. If we look at Ezekiel chapter 25, Verse 13. Ezekiel 25 and verse 13. And he says uh, in Obadiah, now shall be cut off forever. Here's where it's also said in Ezekiel. This is Ezekiel 25, verse 13. He says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. 
and they shall do an Edom according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. So you're seeing by the hand of the Lord will God's vengeance come upon Edom, and he's also saying it, it, it'll be by the hand of my people Israel. And so we're seeing this come into play here. He's going to do this uh, in Edom according to my anger and according to my fury. And this is how it's going to take place here. If you look also at Ezekiel 35, verse 6. He mentions it again, Ezekiel 35, verse 6. He says, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Sith thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Sire most desolate, and cut off from it him that passeth out, and him that returneth. And so you're seeing this come into play here, but this is what we're reading in verse, uh, I believe it's verse 9 and verse 10, where it's talking about uh, everyone of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. You see that in Ezekiel 25 and Ezekiel 35. And he's saying, for thy, violence shall, uh, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. So 9 and 10 is talking about Ezekiel 35, Ezekiel 25. Uh, Obadiah chapter 1, you're seeing the connection here, where this is coming to play, and that uh, Israel is going to be God's channel of uh, fury, God's channel of wrath, that God will allow Israel to be the ones that destroy Edom, and we'll take a look more at that as we keep going. So we see this here, and in verse 11, it says, In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast one of them. And so we see that in verse 11. Now, uh, what that's just talking about is in, in the day when they were carried away, in the fifth course, co the fifth course of judgment. And you see this in uh, you know, the different kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, when they're carried away in their captivities, or when that's going to come into play, uh, you get the northern kingdoms, they get carried away, and uh, the Assyrian captivity, the southern kingdom, they get taken away in the Babylonian captivity. He's saying it's as if you're it's as if you're just one of them. You're just you're sitting by, you're not helping out, you're not you're it's almost like you're you're clapping along with them. You're, you're almost, you know, you're you're enjoying it. Uh the cross reference we won't turn to is Second Kings 25 11, where you just read about how Israel gets taken captive and carried away. And uh, you're just pretty much seeing that they're just sitting there. You know, watching it like it's a movie they're just they're just enjoying it. they're 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 fine with it they're glad with it, that it's happening um verse 12 says uh but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy uh brother in the day that he became a stranger neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of judah in the day of their des uh, destruction neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress so instead of laughing at them and rejoicing over their misery uh, he's saying, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have looked in the day of, uh, you know, their, your brother in the day that he became a stranger, you know, a stranger in Babylon, a stranger in Assyria, a stranger by being taken captive in their captivity. Uh, you know, what are you rejoicing for, Edom, is what Obadiah is saying, is what God's telling him to say. Uh, but if you look at Psalm 137, verse 1, this is what they like to say. Psalm 137, verse 1. This is what we read here. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, this is now them, you know, they're weeping in Babylon, essentially. As we're taken away captive, he says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her, her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even uh, to the foundation thereof. Almost like erase it, you know, like raise it. Or it's even to the foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth 
uh, thee as thou hast served us. So he's pretty much saying in verse 7, to remember, Lord, the children of Edom, they were pretty much saying, you know, go ahead and erase the foundations of Israel as they get taken away in captivity. You know, the nation, that nation was a happy nation that day when the fifth course of judgment played out for Israel going into Babylon, Israel going into, or, or um, you know, them, them being taken away in captivity. So we see that there as we kind of go back into verse um, 11 and 12. He's saying, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Making it a point to say that there. Verse 13 says, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on uh, their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So he's even talking about this here. And so he's talking about how they shouldn't have laid hands on their substance and how they shouldn't have uh, you know, gone into the gate of their people. But if you look at uh, Joel, Joel chapter 3, verse 16 right before the book of Amos, Joel chapter 3, verse 16. And pretty much what you're seeing is, uh, it's sort of like payback. And what you're seeing here is he's saying, as Edom is, is entering into the gates of, his, of, their, of Israel on the day of their calamity, you see that from the first part of uh, verse 13 in Obadiah. Joel 13, I'm sorry, Joel 3, verse 16 says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. We went over that a couple of lessons ago. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Like we were just reading in Obadiah 13. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 13. Strangers, Edom, were passing through in the day of their calamity. They were walking in, uh, hopping in, strolling in, uh, you know, passing through like it was no holy nation. And verse uh, Joel 3, 17, he's saying, Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. And so he's making that point in Joel chapter 3, verse uh, 16 and 17. It's going to be a protected nation. And so we see this there, and then it kind of continues, and it says, So shall uh, you know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, Joel 3. Then shall uh, Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and the fountains shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Uh, Egypt shall be a desolate uh, desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. So you see Edom again here. Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, uh, but Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. So you're seeing a difference here again. Edom will be a desolation while uh, Israel and Judah shall flourish and blossom and grow and dwell forever generation after generation. That's just the book of Joel, as we cross referred back to Obadiah. But he's saying, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gates of my people in the day of their calamity. Verse 13, the first part of it, because in the end, it's going to be where Israel and Jerusalem will be a holy land with the kingdom of priests, and you're not going to be able to, you know, Gentile nation, just cross in as you see fit. God will protect that land, and it'll be where you're not just going to be able to dwell as you please. That's Joel chapter 3. And it says, yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. God's going to pay back as well. If you remember from the captivity, they took, Sennacherib took all their gold, took all their things even out of the tabernacle, the, the holy instruments that were made of gold, uh, the, um, the different, even religious uh, instruments that were there. Everything that was made of that was covered in gold, laid out in gold. Uh, between the two uh, cherubims, everything that was there, cups and bowls and dishes, everything that was gold took, was taken away. And so we see that there in uh, verse 13, uh, laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So we see that come into play there. If you look at Zechariah chapter 14. 
of the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, in verse 1. When it comes back to the payback of their substance, we just saw a little bit about the payback of trespassing into the land. That's not going to be a thing. Now when it comes back to the the um, the taking of their substance. They're going to get paid back for that. It says, "Behold, the day of the Lord." This is Zechariah chapter fourteen, verse one. As we go there, it says, uh, "Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee." For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women uh, ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. Uh, toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And if you drop into verse 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and uh, that day shall be, there be one Lord, and his name one. If you drop into verse 14, you're seeing the kingdom getting set up and everything else. It says, And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together gold and silver and apparel and great abundance. So all the wealth of all the nations are going to be scooped up and gathered and put into Israel. And you're seeing that there, Jerusalem and Judah shall fight at Jerusalem and all the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together. And all that gold and silver and apparel, all that gets plugged in to Israel from all the other nations. The, if you want to get the sheep nations and the goat nations from Matthew chapter 25, these are the goat nations that are getting their spoil, their silver and gold plugged into Israel after this battle or multiple battles where the worm dieth not from Mark 4, 9, uh, 944. But if you also remember Matthew 2, Matthew 2 and we've studied in other books of Isaiah 60 and, and 61 and so forth, the sheep nations come forth and they bring their gold to Israel as well. They offer their gold, they offer their silver because they want to. Those are the sheep nations. Those are what we, we, we studied Haggai chapter two, the shake and stake. The Gentiles put their stake, their, their investments into Israel because they're the sheep nations that want to serve God and flourish. Over here, the goat nations, they get their stuff taken away anyway through, uh, through failure to love the Lord and serve the Lord. Uh, and so we see this come into play um, that it, it ends up all being gods and Israel's and everything else anyway, as a result. So we come back to Obadiah chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 13. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity, it all gets paid back. Joel chapter 3, and Revelation explains more in Revelation 21 and 22. Yeah, they shouldest not have looked upon their affliction in the uh, day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. And substance gets paid back as well. Neither, verse 14, Obadiah 1, 14, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have uh, delivered up those of his that did remain in uh, the day of distress. So we're seeing this there you know, coming into play as well that neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. So those that did escape or tried to escape, you know, there's Edom there trying to stand in the way, you know, laughing at the calamity. And he's saying, you know, neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that uh, remain in the day of distress. And uh, if you look at Amos chapter 1, verse 6, Amos was, we saw a little bit from Amos a little bit earlier. Amos chapter 1, verse 6, he had said this earlier. Amos 1, verse 6, we saw, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. That's verse 6. Now verse 9, so thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brotherly covenant. You know, that they're supposed to be brothers, Esau and Jacob, and yet you know, at every opportunity, they're finding ways to just uh, uh, disrespect uh, Israel 
And we see that there from verse 14. Going back to Obadiah chapter 1, verse 14. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape during the captivities that they went through, Babylonian or Assyrian. And neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. That we see from Amos chapter 1, verse 6, or Amos chapter 1, verse 9, just as some cross-references there. Now we get into verse 15. And what he says here is, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. So as he's, as Obadiah is explaining everything to Edom, saying, you're not much of a nation. They're already trying to get you, these other nations. Your, your, uh, your confederacy is not much. It's, 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 you know, they're already trying to turn against you too. Uh, you shouldn't have turned against your brother Jacob, which is Israel. Uh, there's so much you're going to be paying for. Not only that, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. On top of all things, on top of everything in regards to uh, captivities with regard to Israel and Judah, on top of all this, the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. So we've got that going on too. What you read about Amos and Joel and, and everything else and Isaiah and Jeremiah and everything. It's in the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Now that's that's Genesis 12, 1 through 3 right there. That's the Abrahamic covenant. As you, as much as you've cursed Israel, as much as you've done, it shall be done unto thee. As much as you've cursed Israel, prepare to get some serious cursings. As much as you've blessed Israel, prepare to get some serious blessings. He says, thy reward shall return upon thine own head. And that's what we see here in, in Obadiah 115. And if you look at uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, this is what the Lord is essentially telling this audience in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2 as well. You kind of know this one, but this is where the, where this comes into play. This is why it comes into play. Matthew seven verse two. You know this one it says, uh, "You know, judge not that ye be not judged." He says, "For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again." It's not some nice sweet way to live here in today's day and age. He's saying, well, based on the Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, Abrahamic covenant, that all Gentile nations are going to go and abide by according to how they treat Israel. In this case, he's talking to Israel and those that you've got the um, unbelieving Israel versus little flock of Israel. He said, for what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. That goes back to what he's saying here. He's saying, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. And of course, this time in Obadiah, he's talking to, to the nation of Edom. So he's saying this here. So as we go to verse uh, 16. Going back to Obadiah chapter 1, he says, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. And so we see in verse 16, it says, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, now what is it that they're going to be drinking is the cup of God's wrath. If we look at uh, Psalm 75, verse 8. And it's interesting, we've been turning to Psalms a couple times uh, so far in this study. And that's not unusual because Psalms is not where you go when you when you wake up in the morning and you want to read some daily devotional to help your life out with whatever it is. Psalms is written, it's tribulation doctrine written to the little flock of Israel. It's kingdom information written to the little flock of Israel. It's information that even David was writing about that you know belongs for Israel. Little flock of Israel talks about things that are written for them, to them, about them, with them going through the kingdom, going through the tribulation, antichrist information. And so what you're seeing here, when you get to uh, verse, as we're seeing here in verse 16, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall uh, all the heathen drink continually. If we look at uh, Psalm 75, verse 8, he says, for in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture and he poureth out the same but the dregs thereof, and all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. 
but I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. That's the little flock of Israel. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So you're seeing more about the, there's a cup and the wine is red, full of mixture. He's going to pour out the wrath. And that's Psalm 75, verse 8. So we see a little bit about that there. If you look at Jeremiah again, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15. Jeremiah 25, <clears throat> verse 15. And same concept here. He says, For thus saith the Lord, uh, God of Israel, unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. And so he starts out saying this, and if we look at verse 27 in the same chapter, he says, Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, He shall certainly drink. And he's talking more about that cup of wrath that they're going to you know, be told to go through. And we see we've got some more. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 49, verse 12. Good cross references in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 49, verse 12. And what we see here, he says, uh, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken. And art thou. Uh, he that shall altogether go unpunished, thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt uh, surely drink of it. And he goes forth and talks about this, but you're seeing there more about that cup of wrath. They're going to drink the cup of wrath. So we see this uh, here taking place, so that yea, they shall drink, and, and so on and so forth. If we go back to verse 16 for uh, in Obadiah, Obadiah 1.16, For as ye uh, have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. So they're seeing some uh, serious punishment coming towards them. And so he says uh, in verse 17, he says, uh, But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Talking more about. Uh, them having their, their gold and silver and so forth. They shall have their possessions. He says, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Now, we studied this before as well. If we go back to Joel chapter 2, and we go into verse uh, 30. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. And we see that Joel chapter 2 is not an excuse to start claiming signs and wonders and healings and everything else you can try to get out of it as a Pentecostal or anything. Joel chapter 2, written for the little flock of Israel, written for uh, uh, Israel in general to understand what's going on. Joel chapter 2, and uh, I believe it was verse 30, he was saying, uh, And I shall show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and the pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for... In Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant, whom the Lord shall call. Going back to that little flock, that's going to be the nation for whom deliverance is going to be available. Uh, if one was in the ages to come, one was looking for deliverance from everything that's happening around them. Uh, we see there's a going back to Obadiah 117, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance through God's agency, the little flock of Israel. And there shall be holiness, and it's ultimately God that possesses all the holiness and deliverance, but again, he has his agency of Israel. And uh, the house of Jacob shall be their possessions. And yeah, it shall be their possessions. Verse 18, this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier. I will refer back to it in a minute. He says, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and they and there shall not be any uh, remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now here's our firehouse, firehouse subs, our firehouse verse. But he's saying, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And this is what we were looking at. 
a little bit earlier, we were talking about the idea in verse nine, where we were talking about, we were gonna look at that slaughter and how, you know, in to what capacity, to what detail, uh, you know, the Esau may be cut off by slaughter and uh, they're gonna be cut off forever. You know, I said, we'll come back to that. We'll take a look at that. Well, here we are in verse 18, saying in the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble. If we look at the book of Zechariah, we're gonna see a lot of cross references in there. Zechariah chapter two, verse four, for start. Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 4. And he's saying that the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. Some cross references you see here is uh, Zechariah 2 4. He says, And said unto him, Run, speak to this uh, young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as uh, towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be uh, the glory in the midst of her. And then, of course, we studied this before. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds uh, of the heavens, saith the Lord. But in verse uh, 5, you're seeing the Lord say, uh, I say the Lord will be a Unto her a wall of fire, a protection uh, in this in that, in that day. It's going to be a protection for them. If you look also at um, Zechariah 9, verse 15. And he says that the Lord of hosts shall defend them, and uh, they shall uh, devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine. And they shall be filled uh, like bowls and as the corners of uh, the altar. And, he's going for, and the Lord God shall save them as uh, that day the flock of the people, for they shall uh, be as stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign uh, in the land. And so we're seeing no deliverance taking place here as well. Uh, and if we look at Zechariah 12, 6. Says, and that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in the sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Now you're seeing uh, Israel go forth as God's agency again, not only to distribute you know, the gospel or peace or whatever it is, but you're seeing them as we were seeing back in verse 9, where he's saying, I will make uh, the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and a torch of fire in the sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about. They're going to be God's mighty army of, of just destroying everything they can find. And they're going to go forth and fight God's, you know, fight with God for God alongside you. God doesn't need them, but God is, you know, using them as, as his channel of uh, not only blessings, but in some cases, cursings for the nations round about them. As we're, you know, the, the nations, as we saw, the Confederacy of Nations, uh, or others that are just, you know, the, you've got your goat nation, you've got your sheep nations, and we're seeing this come into play here. Zechariah uh, 12, verse 6, I believe it is. If you look at Zechariah 14, we were here a little bit earlier. Zechariah 14, verse 10. Zechariah 14, verse 10 says, All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate um, unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Heniel's, uh, Heniel unto the king's wine presses. And they shall dwell in it, and there shall uh, be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And so when we see this come into play here, and we plug this back into where we just were in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 18, you're seeing where it says, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, after this use of them being there to devour and destroy. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And this is where we're seeing all these verses in the book of Zechariah coming into play there. But if we look even more at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24, We'll still get more cross references for this. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24. Hope they have a little more back up there. In Isaiah 5, verse 24, 
says, therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And there's a spiritual lesson there, talking more so about what's going on in Isaiah's day. But you see, the consequence, the fire devoureth the stubble, and how the, in this case, they've cast away the law of the Lord. These Gentile nations really never took it up. And that's what you see here. If you look at Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47, verse 14. And we see there it says that the behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not uh, deliver themselves from the power of the flame, there shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. And so it kind of goes forth and mentions this there as well. But again, this is what we're plugging this all into when we talk about, you know, the uh, the firehouse of Obadiah. This is kind of where we're, how we got to this in uh, verse 18. And so we see this, you know, plug into this here. And so you're, we're seeing essentially there that uh, it says, uh, and they shall kindle on them and devour them. This is in verse 18. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. So they're going to be pretty much they're the ones who are going to be eliminated off the map. Remember that confederacy, their goal was to eliminate Israel off the map, and in turn, Edom gets wiped off the map in prophecy. And that's what we see here, that it says in the, the, the last part of verse 18, says, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. The house of Esau is going to be wiped off. The nation of Edom is the one that gets wiped off. And so we see that there. And you can see such cross-references. Um, what we want to see is uh, Isaiah 63, verse 1. Because we're going to see this in two parts. You know, how does this come into play? How does uh, Edom get exactly you know, wiped off the map or the face of the earth? First, we got to see it come into play with two places. And that's, let's see. Yeah, Isaiah 63, verse 1. says, who is this that cometh from Edom? Coming out of Edom here, with dyed garments from Basra, uh, this that is uh, glorious uh, in his apparel, traveling in the strength of his uh, greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden, uh, trodden the wine press alone, and of the people where uh, there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of redeemed is come. So the Lord's saying essentially, you know, he, he takes you know his channel of blessings or cursings in this case, Israel. He goes himself and he slaughters you know, Edom. He comes out of Edom, you know, covered in blood. You see that he's done this to the people, his enemies there, in, uh, and this is what the day of the Lord's all about. If you're his enemy, you better watch out in the time of the day of the Lord. So you see the people of Edom get destroyed here in Isaiah 63, or at least the mentioning of it. He's coming out of Edom already covered in their blood. And so we see this, this is the people. Now, if you want to see more about the land itself you know, being uh, destroyed, if we look at uh, Ezekiel uh, 25, Verse 12. And I think we already visited this verse once, but we'll visit it again. Ezekiel 25, verse 12. We saw the people get destroyed. Now we can see the land. And it says, um, Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself uh, upon them. Uh, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I, also, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance. So we're going to have the Lord destroy the people, and he's going to send Israel in there as well. And the land of Edom will also be completely destroyed as well. If we look at Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Ezekiel 37, verse 1, how we know that this is going to be a, 
possibility or a very capable thing that can happen. And let me see if I can find. Uh, he says, uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 1, he says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out into the spirit, uh, out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. We kind of went over the chapter before. And he talks about can these bones live? And we, we've read this before. And let um, me see if I can find uh, the verse I'm looking for. There it is. Verse 10 says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So there we've got Israel as an army that can go out and do the things that the Lord wants them to do, blessings or cursings or whatever it is, and prophecy. So this army is going to go out and destroy God's enemies as God sees fit. God will also go out in Isaiah 63 and take care of his enemies as he sees fit. And this will be something where the day of the Lord, a great day of wrath and vengeance, <clears throat> takes place as God sees fit. So he'll do what he wants to do, and he'll do as he needs to do. And so we see this here. This will be what takes place in uh, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 18. This is what he's talking about here. And so as we get into verse 19, he says, And they of the south, going back to Obadiah chapter 1, he says, And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, uh, Mount Sair. And they of the plain of the Philistines, and more about that confederacy. That confederacy is now all the land, all the people, everything, all their possessions being taken over now. And it says, and they of the plain of uh, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto uh, Zarephath. And the captivity of uh, Jerusalem, which is in Asher, uh, or Sarad, uh, shall possess the cities of the south. Uh, and so we see this in verse uh, 19 and 20. They're pretty much seeing how this is all coming into play, that they're coming in and they're, they're possessing uh, lands that they conquered. And they're, and they're growing as victory after victory. They're possessing and taking and, and plenty. You can kind of see this you know, coming to play. If you read the book of Joshua, they kind of did the same thing as they kept going. They kept growing. And this is kind of, you know, history repeating itself here. And this is something taking place. And if you look at Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. You see a little more about this um, as well. There. Hosea 1.10, where it's talking about how these are people who are possessing things now. They're victorious in things now. They're taking over things. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10 says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah... And the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for uh, great shall be the day of Jezreel. So we're seeing them come together. Uh, they're, they're coming out as victorious, conquerors, uh, the head, not the tail. Uh, they're coming out as being people who are taking over this, this confederacy and all the lands that are around them, all the Gentile wicked nations, goat nations that are around them. And they're doing this. And so uh, this is also why Paul said uh, what he said, uh, going back again to Romans chapter 9. We saw a little bit about that in Romans chapter 9 from a little bit earlier. But going back one more time, Romans chapter 9, verse uh, 25. And so earlier we took a little bit of a look at Romans 9, 13, and 14, we saw why Paul said what he said about Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated concerning the nations. Now we see in Romans chapter 9, verse 25, he says, as he saith also in Osi, that's the book of Hosea, which we just read, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah saw so crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And so you kind of go through, if, if uh, you know, to study these books, Obadiah, Hosea, 
uh, these minor prophets and helping us understand what God is promising and doing for not only the Gentile nations, the wicked ones and the good ones, as well as the old flock of Israel and even for unbelieving Israel, promising them death and hell and, and everything else, as well as uh, blessings and cursings and the blessings of the kingdom and everything else. When you get into Romans, it's going to make a lot more sense if you've not studied Romans 9, 10, and 11 before. Now it's going to start making sense that, oh, that was Obadiah Paul was talking about. Oh, that was Hosea Paul was talking about. Oh, that's the book of Isaiah yeah, Paul was talking about. You better cross refer it based on what we're studying and what we're reading. So this even helps out when you get to Paul. But So we're seeing this come into play here. We'll go back into verse 19 and 20. And he's saying that they of the south shall possess the Mount of Esau, Mount Sair, and they of the plain... Uh, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephah. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in uh, Sepharad, uh, shall possess the cities of the south. In verse 21, and Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And so we're seeing Saviors coming up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. So we're seeing these little flock kingdom saints coming up uh, on Mount Zion, you know, executing uh, that righteous judgment. You remember from John chapter 7, verse 24, it says that you know, judge righteous judgment. He's telling the little flock of Israel to do such a thing. Judge, you know, judge righteous judgment. And if we look at, say, uh, Zechariah chapter 10, verse 5. Going again to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 5. Talking about these saviors that come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. He tells them this. He says, And they uh, shall be as the mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets of the battle. Uh, and they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on the horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them. For I have mercy upon them, and uh, they shall be as though that I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as though uh, as through wine. And their children shall see it and be glad, and their heart rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them, and gather them, for I have redeemed them. And they shall increase as they have increased, or they will increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall uh, remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt, and gather them out of Assyria, and I will bring them into the uh, land of Gilead and Lebanon, and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea of affliction, and smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. Pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away, and I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, save the Lord. You're seeing these saviors of what's going to take place, how they're going to come and be brought together into uh, Israel, and they're going to come up on Mount Zion to judge uh, the Mount of Esau. And you're seeing this come into play here. Even Peter talks about this. If you look at uh, Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse uh, 28. They have a structure and they have an order. We're seeing as Israel is gathered and brought together. It's 1928. And he's, he's saying to him, as Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. And so you're seeing them just talk about that they have, uh, shall sit in the throne of glory, shall sit upon 12 thrones. So these are going to have 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to have others that are judging Mount Sire, and they're going to be judging the nations around them, going to war again. There's all sorts of things that are going to be taking place. Uh, these saviors, so to speak, are going to be uh, coming up and judging the Mount of Esau. But yet you've got people who judge over these saviors, and that's where you're seeing people who are judging over the 12 tribes of Israel. And you're just seeing a structure here. The point is you're seeing structure. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. You can see that in Psalm 22 or Jeremiah 50. Psalm 22, 28, the exact verse, or Jeremiah 50, 
verse 28. Of course, the little flock gets this too. If we look and we'll kind of wrap up with this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. When it says that the kingdom shall be the Lord's, you can see all sorts of verses talking about how the kingdom will be the Lord Jesus Christ. A little flock also gets it as well based on, you know, their, their covenant standing with the Lord, whether they're blessed or cursed because of it. Uh, Matthew 5 verse 3 talks about, you know, what kind of status they're going to need to be in after the fact that they go through all these things in the book of Joel and the book of Obadiah and the book of Haggai and the book of Habakkuk and the book of Amos. And a lot more than that, book of Isaiah, all sorts of these events that you read about in the day of the Lord. And he says uh, in Matthew 5, 3, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're going to go through so much, their spirit's going to be crushed, poor in spirit, as they go through the day of the Lord and the events thereof and the events of the book of Revelation, that uh, theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they that, that mourn. There's going to be so much to mourn over. Uh, if they're happy as uh, can be buying and selling and just joining up with the antichrist then uh, you know there's no place for them but they'll be comforted and blessed are the meek psalms talks about this as well for they shall inherit the earth none of us inherit the earth blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness and there's going to they're going to be hungering for righteousness and when the lord comes joel chapter 3 and uh, and amos and then uh, zechariah that's going to be something that they're going to be be hungry for and dying for the little flock is saying no lord please so let's let's set up this kingdom already let's go and then uh, uh blessed are they verse six which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled blessed are the merciful there's going to be a lot that they're going to you know need to be merciful for if they can get more into their little flock camps and so on and a lot of other things as well you know helping people out when so much so much disaster is going on for they shall obtain mercy and blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god in israel literally being there as the light and source of everything blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be the children of god there's gonna be plenty to make peace over when there's so much war blessed are they uh which are persecuted for righteousness by the antichrist and his mark of the beast economy for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They'll have it, the true kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And then it kind of just goes off and they're talking about all these different things. But eventually the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's what we're seeing in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 21. So we see everything going on through here. I wanted to do, like I said earlier, just a quick rundown of Obadiah's firehouse that we're seeing here, which is kind of matching up with everything we went through previously. And, uh, you know, the uh, Haggai 2 shaking steak, the uh, Daniel's Little Caesar, and Amos' Olive Garden, now Obadiah's Firehouse. So kind of doing a quick rundown of this is what we wanted to do today. Just wanted to see if there's any other uh, thoughts or comments or questions on anything we went through today. And uh, kind of pick it up from there. But this was kind of the study we were looking to do. See if there's any kind of thoughts on anything. Yeah, that's very, very good. Very cool. So we'll definitely go into another one on uh, Wednesday. But yeah. John? Yeah. I'm guessing, and this is only just way out there, but eat him as toast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I don't think you missed a, any reference to eat him, Ephraim, Seer, Sayer, or anything connected to them that was in the bible <laughs> so uh, Gina, i want to ask you dean what gave you that impression uh the thoroughness with which it was covered and not just a quick rundown <laughs> quick quick in the sense of yes just over an hour but not quick in the sense of uh yeah 15 20 minutes <laughs> In the sense of all the work we put in. Yeah. Um, I, just, I don't know. I was thinking as you were going through this whole list that, uh, okay, so originally the brothers were okay. Then they were on the outs because uh, sold the birthright. And then they're back on the ins because Jacob comes back and tries to, you know, impress his brother with the gifts and he says nah, don't worry about it you know just i got plenty of my own um so maybe there was a good time there 
but I can't help but think, but how, why, how, and why would Edom later on turn against the brotherly covenant or, or whatever you want to make be it known as, other than just what I'm thinking? And it is, okay, yeah, there may have been a, yeah, there was a falling out there with the beans, but the. Uh, you know when he came back. Okay, there may have been some some reconciliation there, but I don't I don't know if it was complete because the only way I can see Edom turning away from Israel later on is some kind of uh, bad blood or bad you know animosity. You know Esau had left that kind of filtered down into his sons, and then that just passed along to their sons, and you know it kind of grew. I don't, that's the only thing I can think of, but that's all I got. Yeah. yeah you're right. I mean, I, I don't think it would come from God. God, I don't think God would place that, that kind of hatred upon them. But, you know, I think it would just kind of filter down from, from the beginning. It just wasn't all great. So, a lot of resentment. Got, yeah. Re that's the word I'm looking for resentment. Yes. You're the second person that's done that to me today. Brought the word out I needed. <laughs> <laughs> so very clear. That's why I was able to catch it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, resentment there. And it just kind of filtered through the family. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, you know, it, Ishmael, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Could flow through him as well. Yeah. Down through the to the Muslims and all. Absolutely. So yeah. yeah, I just wanted to go through that. I think we'll do another couple studies. I got about what we got two more weeks, and then we'll be away for a month. So oh, wow. about two more weeks. And I just got started coming back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, yeah, we'll uh, be back here on Wednesday. We'll do another study, and then uh, yeah, we might make about four more studies, and then we'll uh, you know, be be gone for a month. So, so, all right, we'll uh, wrap up here and then we'll get back here in a couple of days. All right.